This is my second year. And um, before I introduce our speaker, we will do, uh, we will start uh, with a prayer. So let us remember we're in the Holy Presence of God. And this is a prayer uh, for our earth by Pope Francis. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe, in everything, in the smallest of your creatures, and you embrace your tenderness, all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love, that we may protect life and beauty. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world. As we journey towards your infinite life, we ask that you're with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, as we look to bring beauty, peace, love, and justice into our world. Amen. 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 Well, I'm just thrilled to be here. First of all, I, I want to thank, um, before I introduce Ryan, um, if I could have uh, thank our founders and the speaker series that they put on today. And if you're a founder in that special committee club, do you just mind standing real quick so we can acknowledge all the work that you do? Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I kind of just get to show up and listen and learn, but all the hard work was done by you and of course Judy and, and everyone. And so it's my privilege to introduce Ryan McNamee, class of 2004, and I've heard from a variety of teachers, so I'm not just saying this, that he was he was the real deal in school. He was kind, he was smart. And so um, so it's so thrilling to welcome him back to Hill Murray. And uh, he's a fifth generation family member, obviously, of Bailey Nurseries. And he's going to talk a whole lot tonight. And I'm supposed to be brief, but he's going to talk also about his book, The Field Guide to Outside Style, which I will be buying for my mother for Mother's Day. And uh, please join me in giving him a warm round of applause. Welcome. Thank you so much. It is uh, a really special and unique honor to be back today, um, and even more special seeing some of my old teachers here. So thank you for coming. <laughs> I hope that I uh, live up to the hype that you just gave. So uh, thank you again. My name is Ryan McEnany. Um I'm going to give a little bit of background to myself before we start talking about Bailey or the plants. Um, when I went to Hill, which feels like forever ago, or almost my three year reunion, which feels very odd to say, but uh, it's, it's so great to be back here. Um, when I was at Hill, uh, I was the first in my family to come to Hill Murray. It was sort of a weird story, but um, a really good friend of mine from elementary school, um, I went to school in Woodbury, and he said, my cousin plays basketball for Hill Murray. I had never heard of Hill at that time. So if you want to come to a basketball game, and we took the entrance exam the next day, and here we are. So uh, it was uh, an amazing six years to be here. When I first started at Hill, um, I didn't really know what I was doing. It was seventh grade, and um, my parents said, if you're going to not do sports, you got to do something to keep yourself active. So in eighth grade, I started doing uh, theater and started uh, singing. And my mom is here in the back, uh, and she will attest that the worst voice was ever. not good. <laughs> very, very, very bad. Uh, and would sing a lot in the car, and I hope at least it's changed a little bit since then. But I did a lot of a lot of shows uh, at Hill. This was uh, back in like a really epic hair time with Les Mis. Um, and this was uh, actually the last time I was here was for the. Uh, the funeral reception for Mark Paulson. Um, so I had to put a picture of Mark in there because he was so transformative uh, for who I am today and so many of us that went through the theater program here at Hill uh, really changed uh, all of our lives. But it was uh, really an amazing experience to be here. I was a very shy kid. For those of you that had me when I was in seventh or eighth grade, I didn't say a whole lot and that's changed. <laughs> I was asking how long I, I was supposed to be speaking and she said, can you do 45? I was like, I can do an hour and 45. <laughs> but I promise I won't. Uh, so after, after Hill Murray, I uh, had a brief moment in St. Louis. I thought I was going to be a doctor. My, uh, Mrs. Grau, I, I, was, I was a bio major for one year. My grandpa on my dad's side was a doctor went to St. Louis University, and I got into a program where I was accepted to SLU Medical School as an undergrad. I thought, yeah, don't worry about my MCAT score, I'm in. 
And I did it and I took OCAD and I said, no, oh, maybe not for me. And so at that point, I moved to California and I was very interested in movies and acting and all that for spending five years doing that here. And I fell into a really amazing position uh, with a PR agency. My first year, uh, my first summer was very interesting. I worked with a reality star. For those of you that remember Flava Flav from Public Enemy, he was my first client when I was 18 years old. So you can imagine that experience. Uh, then I came back and I undergraduated from St. Thomas and then moved back to LA to work uh, in PR again. And I had the really amazing experience to work with a lot of huge uh, actors, producers, directors. Uh, I worked on the Sex and the City series. I represented Jude Law, Kristen Wake. So I remember working with Kristen when she was on Saturday Night Live, writing the script for Bridesmaids. Um, I helped watch uh, the TV show Glee, which as a musical theater kid was a really special treat. I represented Ryan Murphy. Um, and so this is me and some of the Glee cast uh, from their first season rap party. Um, and then from there moved to uh, the beauty side of entertainment and ran the West Coast office of an agency that represented hairstylists and makeup artists and that side of it. And from there, got back into music, which was so important to me, and started working with uh, Mariah Carey, Nicki Minaj, uh, which was a really interesting experience for any of you that know about Nicki. Don't recommend. Uh, <laughs> this is a safe space, right? Uh, but Mariah, the diva, is like one of the kindest people. It was a really, really incredible experience to work with Mariah. Um, and so I moved home, as a good Midwesterner does, I, uh, my mom and I share a birthday, and I came home uh, on a nice, beautiful summer day, and said, I can be back here, and, and moved back, and then that winter was the first big polar vortex winter. <laughs> so, uh, really smart choice. But I moved back and started freelancing around the cities, and um, then started working for Bailey, uh, which is our family's business, and started freelancing, and then in 2013, went back in-house, and uh, one of the big reasons that I did that is to work with my mom and, and learn from her and continue on uh, the tradition of our family working in this business. And one thing that, that we've learned over these five generations is the value of working outside of the business and working hard and knowing where your place is. And so when I came in, one of the things that, that she said to me was, make sure that you know that people are always watching. And don't just do your job, but work harder. Prove to them that you should be here, not because I am your mom or because your family owns this company, but because you deserve to be here. And it's been a really incredible treat to have that uh, sort of in the back of my mind over these last 10 years that I've been at the company um, and helping continue that tradition on, hopefully contributing in a really positive way. Um, so at the company now, uh, in our fifth generation, is me and my brother, Danny. Uh, who is the class of 2007 from Hillary. Uh, we, this was a number of years ago, we were doing something to celebrate the history of the organization, and we found this really, well, we didn't find, he wears it all the time, tattered jacket of my grandpa's that Danny's got on. You can see there's big, huge rips down the side. <laughs> I ran into uh, our, my mom's uncle, Gordy, today, who's 87, I think? and still comes to the office all the time and he asked if he could get a new jacket because his is in worse shape than that. Uh, and then this is my dad's jacket from when he worked at the nursery in the 80s. And so it's really been a, a really special experience to have all of that history and learn from it um, as we look to continue the company into the future. So just to give you a little perspective on the organization, um, we were founded in 1905, this is J.D. Bailey on your left hand side, our founder. Um, he bought uh, 10 acres of land in what was at that time Red Rock, now is Newport, Woodbury, sort of that weird triangle at 61 and 494, up on the top of the hill, really terrible, poor soil. And he started farming fruits and vegetables and started amending the soil. And that's how we started the sort of Bailey Nurseries. We sold a lot of fruits, vegetables at the St. Paul Farmer's Market. Um, and as you can see, always a family business. Uh, lots of kids working, helping in the fields. Right around the, uh, their house, which is still our main office at our family, at the, at the nursery, built in 1902. This is actually out in front of the main office. 
You can see the shakes in the background. That is uh, now our boardroom upstairs, what was uh, veterans at the time, and some of the, the kids in the family working out front. And always the uh, entrepreneur and always the innovator, uh, J.B. Bailey was, I believe, the first or one of the first uh, people to have a vehicle at the St. Paul Farmer's Market, which really helped grow the business, um, being able to have multiple loads every day rather than just the one that everyone else was doing. So at that time, really sort of growing, expanding from fruits and vegetables into ornamental shrubs, uh, as you can see, tied to the car there, and uh, helped to really start to expand the business. Uh, this is the home uh, in 1942. It honestly doesn't look that much different, and we just remodeled the office or the exterior of the office last fall, and made sure to retain this so it still looks, at least from the front, still looks like the old farmhouse. This is 1965. You can see that it started expanding this space with it's all the trees there, and then the parking lot was some of that original land that they were farming and started building cold storage, um, which I'll show you some pictures of the inside of what it looks like now. Uh, but again, talking about innovation, it's something that's so uh, ingrained in who we are as an organization and all of the people that work at Bailey, we were one of the first, if not the first, in the horticulture industry to have this cold storage facility. So when you would dig plants in the fall, you could bring that in, keep it cold longer into the spring season, which would extend your shipping window. And so this is still, if you know uh, Woodbury, this is that split of Bailey Road and Military Road off in the corner. Uh, someone asked me earlier about uh, the big fire we had, and I think it was 2008. Uh, this building right here is one of the old storage uh, buildings that uh, burnt down on our birthday. I was living in California at the time and called my mom and said to say happy birthday. She said, the building's on fire, I can't talk. <laughs> so uh, that is now our HR building. <laughs> So every generation, we, there's big learning, and big change that comes with it, but we're really grounded in the history of the business and the ethos of J.D. Bailey, uh, who's our founder. Every year, uh, we give an award to an employee, the J.D. Bailey Award. We just celebrated uh, with dinner a couple of weeks ago for this year's award recipient. And it, every year, the person that is chosen represents these, uh, these attributes that JP uh, lived every day. And it really is what drives us as an organization. And to make it to a fifth generation is really incredibly rare. It's 0.3% of businesses make it this far. And I think the only reason that we have is number one, really, really good people. But two, having this foundation, knowing who you are as when you're hiring people, you're bringing in someone that really belong, believes in your values. and. Integrity is intentionally uh, number one, um, and that is just so important in, in who we are as a business, always speaking the truth, uh, saying no when you have to, um, and providing leadership not just within our organization, but within the industry, and always looking, looking forward. Um, the piece that, that I love is the creativity and finding inspiration and in new ways of doing things, and that I think is one of the things that's really driven our success as, we, uh, as we've grown over the years. We also had a really uh, fun ex experience when I joined the company to look at updating our core values, and again, like who we are as a business, but being able to then communicate that to our team so that we're all aligned. And again, integrity is still number one, but also that idea of being progressive and innovative and looking forward, paying attention to who our customer is, holding ourselves accountable, and stewardship. Uh, we were just talking about the envi environmental program here at Hill and students that are so interested and engaged in sustainability and how important that is. And we're a, a, a large organization in horticulture. Um, we are not just here in Minnesota, but also Oregon, Washington, Illinois, and Georgia. And it takes a lot of resources to grow our product, a lot of water, plastic pots. And so being able to continually think about how to be more sustainable is so ingrained and so important in who we are, as well as growth of our, our employees. And from that, we we're trying to think about how do we package this all together? How do we make this something that anyone that we talk to can really understand? And so we came up with this theme of growing what's next. And it, it's not just growing plants and growing the next best variety, but focusing on our people and our process. And that really is what has driven us. And so 
hopefully you can see this through the sun, but it'll give you a little bit of a perspective of what Bailey looks like today and all of the different types of products we grow. This is at our facility in Washington where it's mostly a, 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 a fruit seed farm. So we grow a lot of fruit trees uh, and that's where the seed comes from. We, we try as much as we can to have everything come from within our own production and not buy a lot in or buy cuttings. Uh, this is at our facility out in um, Oregon. This is on Saudi Island, which is right outside Portland. We grow a lot of bare root, which is what this is, uh, either for our internal use uh, or for other growers. Not too many retailers sell bare root anymore. There are some that do, which is basically they pull the plant out, shake the dirt off, that's a bare root shrub or a tree. Uh, and that's, so that's a lot of what our production is. Uh, this is back in uh, Washington as well. Uh, one of the other things that we are really focused on is providing uh, our customers, our grower customers, with new products every year. Uh, that doesn't necessarily just mean new plant varieties, but uh, new types of products that help them with their uh, efficiencies. So we're building another four acres of greenhouses in Cottage Grove uh, to help support that. But at the end of the day, it's all about people. And we were just having this conversation uh, in a meeting today, actually. Someone asked, uh, we do a round table within our department meetings and say, what makes your job so exciting? Why do you come to work every day? And every single person in the team said, it's the people. And it's not just the people at Bailey, but the industry. We have this really weird relationship that, that most people don't have, where within our industry, even our biggest competitors, we collaborate with all the time. Because at the end of the day, we're just trying to get people to plant more plants and make them work more beautiful and sustainable and ecological, all those things, right? So this is uh, a group of our team that we had together last year. Uh, this is a old 1942 Ford, I think it was, that was a, a gift to an employee when he retired. And uh, he recently passed away, and so we brought him back from his estate and uh, are renovating now. So we brought a little bit of that history back to the company. Just to give you a little uh, overview of some of the types of products and some of the things that we do, um, it's not just growing stuff outside. We also have a lab at our facility in Oregon that does tissue culture. So we take all these tiny little baby plants, um, and you can see it's very like a surgical environment that they have it all built in, and then they plant it in these really specialized formulas. You can see like almost a little jelly on the bottom, uh, and then they grow. So this right here is an elm tree. So you know how big elm trees get. This is how they start. And this is how we get it in that tissue culture, is how we get it so that we have exact replicates. We also, I mentioned, do as much as we can to produce everything and start it in-house before we uh, throw it on. This is uh, actually one of the hydrangeas that's out front called Popstar Hydrangea, taking cuttings in our greenhouse facility. This is uh, down in Cottage Grove. We've got 33 acres right now, almost 30, will be 37 acres of greenhouses that we're producing in here as well as out in Oregon. We take those cuttings and we plant them out. This is uh, all panicle hydrangeas right here, and then some uh, nine bark in back. But if you can sort of make it out, it looks like little gravel. All these cuttings are stuck in sand, and that's how they develop their root system before they get dug out. And then they'll either get planted in something like this, which is just a quart-sized little tray, that then will get upshifted into a container, otherwise they'll go back out in the field. So each of these bays have tens of thousands of hydrangeas, or not hydrangeas, we sell a lot of hydrangeas, <laughs> but <laughs> of, of, of the shrubs and trees. And then imagine 37 acres of that, it's pretty incredible. For those that don't go into those trays, they'll sometimes get planted straight out into the field. This is uh, out at our facility on Saudi Island in Oregon, and you can see the tractor that they're all sitting on. Uh, I mentioned innovation a lot, and that's something that we have a fabrication shop at all of our sites that they built uh, specifically to use this type of plug, or the little thing that, you know, the little tiny one with the roots on it, to go through that so that they can sit so they don't hurt their back. And then it digs the trench, plops it in, and then they go behind and just kick the dirt over it. So this is all Popstar, again, that hydrangea that's outside. All these cuttings that came from the greenhouse get put in the, on the tractor and then planted in. And then again, 
hundreds of thousands of them. And this is a different type of plant, but this is what it looks like after about one growing season. This is uh, down in Hastings uh, in Minnesota. So lots of these uh, bare root plants, again, we grow a lot for our internal production uh, and also sell outside. In addition to all the shrubs we grow, we grow lots and lots and lots of trees too. Trees are a very long-term crop. So you saw that little elm tree in there. To get to something of this size can take six, seven, eight years. So you know, if you go to the garden center and the tree is 100 or 150 bucks, it's because it takes that long to get it from a cutting to where you can actually buy it at the garden center. It's a really long-term process. So we grow it, this is just straight to the dirt. We also grow them in containers. So for those of you that go out to a garden center, this is spring snow uh, crab apple. Uh, grow a lot. Uh, this is at the Mogren Farm in Hastings. So I talked a lot about bare roots. When we dig it up in the fall, I talked about the cold storage. This is the inside of the cold storage facility. These are all trees. So inside, depending on where you are in the in the green or in the coolers, can be anywhere from 30, 32 degrees up to 35, 36 degrees, and about 90% humidity. And the reason is because these plants are all dormant. But we've got to keep them alive without watering them because we don't want to produce a lot of mold. We keep it incredibly uh, humid in there. This is an, just another perspective of what it looks like. Each of these coolers is like a football field and a half, and they're stacked floor to ceiling. So each of these, uh, this farm here in uh, Woodbury, Cottage Grove, Newport area, has anywhere from six to seven million plants to go through a year. The greenhouse that I showed you uh, has over 10 million plants that go through it every year. And that's just this facility here in Minnesota, not to mention what we've got out in Oregon. So it takes a lot of plants, a lot of people to get those moving. Uh, so a lot of those are grower products. We also have to sell to our independent garden center customers. Uh, this is our facility in Woodbury, uh, our container field all the way down past uh, St. Ambrose, for those of you that know the Woodbury area. Uh, this is where we grow all of our containers to on. So this uh, in front here is all bloomstruck hydrangea. Uh, but we've got some hoop houses out there as well where we store things over the winter and sort of stage crops a little bit so that we can get some, especially in years like this when we had a winter until it feels like July. Uh, we need to get things moving a little bit so that our garden center customers can have some green plants. So we'll also grow uh, in some of those hoop houses uh, this is also that facility in Woodbury. It really changes throughout the season. So if you drive by, uh, it, it never looks the same uh, as, this, as the season goes on. Inside those greenhouses, we also do what we call bud and bloom. So the plants that you see out there were all forced into uh, bloom early in the season for Mother's Day. So this is what it looks like in there. Again, each of those bays, tens of thousands of plants. And so we have a couple hundred thousand of these hydrangeas that will come out every single spring. Um, to do it, it's really pretty incredible how much effort and time people put in to figure out the science behind this. Because these plants have to be dormant for a certain number of days, so they have to pull them out early, put them in a cooler, get it to the right temperature so that they go dormant but don't die, then know exactly the time that it comes out so they can hit that date exactly for when they ship out and they're looking like that. Because if they don't look like that, if they don't have enough color, it's not that exciting in retail, right? You want it to look like this. But if it goes too far and they get it done too early, then the blooms are spent. And you also don't want to buy that either, right? So it's really, really incredible how much work uh, has gone into it. Um, we were doing a project that they're never going to be allowed to do again a few years ago when we had the Super Bowl in Minnesota. Uh, because of my background in LA, I was like, oh, we can do anything that's really fun and big, right? Uh, so we. We produced like 3,500 of these hydrangeas to be perfect like this, January 1. <laughs> the production, our production friends will never let me do it again. But they did a great job. It was beautiful. We did uh, the, the purple hydrangea right here. It's one of the Vikings. Maybe the Vikings will be in the Super Bowl. Which will be neat. But we produced a bunch of these purple ones. And so the, uh, the official NFL party where all the teams and all that go, that's like the really super exclusive one, even though we provide all the plants, even we couldn't go in there to help set it up. Uh, but it's really, really incredible uh, the work that they do. So in addition to being growers of plants, which is our main function day to day, we also are a marketing company. 
which is where I fit in. I'm our marketing and communications manager, uh, as well as spokesperson for these three brands. So we, in 2004, uh, started, goes a lot, far, a lot further back than that, 1998, when I started here at Hill Murray, the original plant for Endless Summer Hydrangeas was discovered in Cottage Grove. Um, and at that point, there really was not much of a, there was no plant brands that didn't really exist, uh, which now everything is branded, right? Uh, that didn't exist. And so over the next 15 years, there's a lot of work done at Bailey, as well as one of our partners in Georgia, to introduce this new thing uh, called Endless Summer Hydrangeas. It was a hydrangea that could survive and bloom in Minnesota, which didn't really happen before that. And it had this gene that allowed it to rebloom. So even if it died back in the winter, the, the older varieties would have a green shrub. And I would say, if you want a green shrub, buy a green shrub, don't buy a hydrangea, right? So it had this ability to survive in zone four, and it had this remontancy or this reblooming trait in it. And so it came to market in 2004, and it's still, to this day, the best-selling collection of hydrangeas in the world. We've sold over 35 million hydrangeas just in this one collection alone. So as a brand owner, we are responsible for all the new genetics, all the new breeding. One of them is out front, we'll talk about in a little bit, as well as all the marketing for North America, and then working with our partners overseas on the marketing for that as well. So in the summer is our best-selling brand that we've got. Uh, we also have a collection of roses called Easy Elegance. It was bred uh, internally at Bailey for roses that will not just survive in Minnesota, but thrive here, uh, be incredibly uh, floriferous, as well as disease resistant, because some of the older roses get a lot of black spot or powdery mildew. Um, they, if, they do a lot of work in the winter, tip them and cover them and all that. We don't want that, that's too much work. So these are all shrub roses in a bunch of different you know, sizes and colors, but you don't have to do anything to in the winter, which makes it that much easier. Uh, and then the next, uh, the final brand that we introduced in 2008 is called First Editions. And this is a collection of shrubs and roses and trees and vines and perennials, sort of a catch-all of all really great new plants that offer something different in the landscape. And there are some companies that are just pumping out new plants every year. We are not one of them. We are very slow and methodical uh, and would rather, like this year, introduce four new plants that are really, really good and really different and offer something unique uh, or better than already exists than put out 20 just because we need new plants. Uh, so this has been uh, a really fun experience to watch at the end of the summer. I remember came out the year I graduated from Hill and I remember for the first time seeing a uh, billboard that Bailey put up, and it was right uh, by downtown St. Paul, kind of by the airport, getting on 52. And I still remember this day that seeing that billboard, I'm like, gosh, that's pretty darn cool. And so, full circle, to be back and be working on these brands is really exciting. So, thinking about where we're going in the future, uh, we're having a lot of those conversations right now about what's next for us. There's been so much instrumental change. The fourth generation, with uh, my mom at the leadership at the helm, the brands is huge. It has taken us from a uh, mostly Minnesota, but Minnesota, Oregon-based nursery, grower nursery, to now being a massive player on the international stage. There's been so much of that that's changed. The people that we have, the process, how we interact with our, our industry is totally transformed in the fourth generation. So what we do next, I know we have big shoes to fill, but we are really focused on automation. We were having a conversation earlier about if you could hire one person, who would it be? And we talked about AI and automation because we are a very labor intensive business. When I was growing up working at the nursery when I didn't know a darn thing about plants, for those of you that remember when I was in high school, I was about maybe 120 pounds soaking wet and I worked in the fields in the summer unloading like 25 gallon trees that were coming in from the West Coast. It's hard work. <laughs> and so finding ways to get past some of that or get, allow people that are on our team to not do things like spacing plants and actually use their brains. So finding ways to automate, this is a, a planting machine. This is not at Bailey, we just got this machine, uh, I think this winter, so they're working on programming right now, but it's an automated sticking machine. So you program and like take all these different pictures to say, this is a good cutting, this is a bad cutting, and it can go through and pick them up, it gets rid of the bad ones, keeps the good ones, and does all that automatic planting. 
So we're looking at really cool things like that to help speed up the process, but again, allow employees to use their brains on, uh, on more important work. Uh, new plants, while well, I said we are slow and methodical in introducing them, new plants are still very, very important, especially since we are a brand owner. Uh, so, uh, gosh, six, seven years ago now, we bought a breeding company uh, down in Georgia, and uh, in the last few years moved to a new farm. This is uh, in Athens, just outside, or just by the University of Georgia. Uh, so this is our new property. We've got about 30 acres that we work on there. This is where we do all of our breeding for new plants. We uh, also work with a number of breeders all around the world to help bring new plants to us, including those up in zone two in Canada, all the way down uh, to Florida, uh, as well as partners all across Europe and Asia as well, and do a lot of our initial trialing here uh, before sending that up to Minnesota, Oregon, and we have uh, a number of university partners that we do testing with as well. Uh, but this is a uh, farm in Georgia where David Roberts, who is our director of plant breeding, does all of his work. And you can see uh, the tray that he's got in front of him on the picture on the left. These are all little hydrangea seedlings. And so for that one plant that we have up front that I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, that finally made its introduction, he might start with 10, 15,000 individual seedlings every single year to get to one. The plant that, we're, that we introduced this year, he found that initial seedling in 2014, and we are just now introducing it. So this is a really important piece of our future. Not only looking at our internal process and finding ways to automate, finding ways to engage with our people in a different way, but also looking at bringing out new, better plants to market. We're also really focused, I mentioned on sustainability, as well as looking at plants that will adapt to climate change and that are more water-wise, that are pollinator friendly, that are native, or uh, there's a term called native R. Uh, I've been doing a lot of book talks over the last uh, few months and I've asked if anyone knows the term native R and not one person has raised their hand. You know it? Finally, one person! <laughs> So a native R is a native species plant, so native to our region that has evolved here over thousands of years, but is a cultivar or a variety that has been selected. And so that's been a really big part of our work is to find some of these native R's that are better, uh, arguably better for our ecological system, for our pollinators, and help introduce them to the world. Uh, this picture, let's see if we can get back sort of easily. See that kind of weird looking one in the middle? That one's called a button bush. And the species, Cephalanthus, is uh, really big and rangy and ugly, uh, but it's great for wetland restoration. So if you've got like that weird wet spot in your yard that stays wet until like June, uh, which I do of course directly in the middle of our backyard, uh, instead of putting in drain tiles and doing all that, you can plant plants that will naturally suck up that water. But button bush is ugly. And so we have this selection that was discovered about 10, 15 years ago that we now call fiber optics um, that is more restrained. It's only going to get about five feet tall, perfectly round shape, great pollinator plant, is native to our region. Um, again, it's used in wetland restoration. The seed, when that goes to seed and fall, great for waterfowl. So it's just a great plant. But it's, we found a way, to, or found a variety that is much better for a modern landscape. Native bars also, you can find them that have better disease resistance, longer flowering. So a great way to bring that native plant into our real gardens today. And so that's a really, really big focus as we uh, look to the future. So speaking of plants, should we talk about plants and design a little bit? Okay, so I've been doing a lot of these uh, design talks, and so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna spend the full hour that I usually do. I'm gonna speed through some of it, but I'm always here to answer questions afterwards, or you can always email me too. But start looking at something like this. This is at our at our uh, facility in Cottage Grove. Really, really pretty, right? We've got some hydrangeas, some nine barks, some Carl Forrester grass. Looks pretty darn easy. But when you're going in to start working on a project, it can be really, really intimidating. There's all these things that you have to think about. And uh, even though I grew up in the business, I did not know a darn thing about plants. Uh, and then I left and you know, did the other thing, and I still knew nothing about plants. 
So since I've been back, I've been doing some of these projects, and uh, so when I started working on this book, instead of getting like into a really heady design book that like you have to really be a horticulturist to understand, so let me write this book for me like 15 years ago. What would I need to like break down all of this and take that scariness away and just make it really fun? And so throughout the book, there's like. We do dates at home or you know, your coffee talk and you go look at the neighborhood and see what you like and what you don't like. You got happy hour, the best part of the day where you start living in the sun. You do brunch where you're talking about soil. Like some of the fun stuff, some of the not so like soil. It can be fun, but it also <laughs> maybe not the most exciting topic. So we have brunch and, and fun with it instead. So we get through all that and figure out what your space offers to you talk about the really hard stuff that I'm really bad at, like budgeting, uh, and how much you want to put into your space. Sorry, Mom. Uh, and then we get to start talking about design. And so the whole book is about making a uh, design that is really specific to you. And so I was like, how the heck am I going to write a book that is supposed to be for any individual that reads it, but also be broad enough to like help give a construct? And so I created these three archetypes to help at least give a little bit of structure for you to start with. Uh, the first one is the Martha. You might have an idea of who this is based on. Uh, this is that sort of classic, like, cottage garden design. Really refined style, really intentional planting. Probably has a mix of edibles, annuals, perennials, shrubs, roses, kind of all of that mixed in, but not too closely planted, but really, really beautiful. Classic. If you know, if you've seen anything from Martha Stewart lately, it is not boring, it is really, really fun, uh, really cool, lots of color and texture. Um, it's been uh, really fun over the last number of years. I've gotten to know uh, Martha's personal gardener, uh, Ryan McAllister, and so I, of course, I sent him a book before it was out, and so Martha got to read it, and she liked this section, so. <laughs> Big win! So this is an example of what I would call a Martha garden. We were talking about uh, Japanese maples earlier, so this is obviously not a picture from Minnesota, uh, because we can't get the Japanese maples to look like this, but a really beautiful, again, sort of that classic design you've got, just so happens to be in the summer, the original planted with some irises in front, you've got some uh, uh, Japanese grass in front, and then you've got some of that beautiful stone that is probably very of place or where they're from. So again, pretty classic design. This is uh, a colleague of ours out on Cape Cod. This is her she shed. Uh, she does this for a living, so obviously hers is very, very intense, but beautiful. Um, again, she's got some cannibal hydrangeas here. She's got some yugo pine. Um, what she's done here, she's got this really incredible space. She has no turf grass. Every single thing has been replaced. Um, but. For this section, one of the things that we like to look at is how we pull all those pieces together. Because again, she's got her whole front yard is this beautiful gravel garden that then goes up to this, then she's got her driveway, and then a whole other section that's planted there. So for her, we're talking a lot about color echo. So to help bring all of her pieces together, you've got you know, a little bit of the red in the box here. You've got, you can't see it, but it's sort of out of focus. Red uh, back over uh, the other side of her driveway in that landscape. But again, really sort of, sort of densely planted, but very intentional. There's legible lines there, and using that color to start drawing things together. The next one is the Kelly. This is uh, based uh, on my very good friend Kelly Norris. He was the horticulture director at the Greater Des Moines Botanic Garden, and he uh, has a fabulous new book uh, out called New Naturalism. Uh, that's all about you know, sustainability, looking at native plantings. Very, very dense. This is his front yard. Probably looks a little different than most of ours, but this is his front yard planting. Um, it's really about texture, about seasonality. I like to call it intentional wildness because it is very, very lush. Uh, this is a design style that I say you need to have some time and know how to do it because otherwise it can get overwhelming and can get really hard to maintain. This is a garden, our garden. Uh, in Cottage Grove that I was talking about earlier, there might be something at the auction uh, that would bring you to this garden uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, but this is a garden that actually Kelly helped us uh, update the design for, uh, where we took what was like a shrub, 
mulch, tree mulch, and it was pretty, but now it's really pretty. And so, but again, really dense planting, lots of big swaths of color, lots of ornamental grasses to add a lot of texture in there. Uh, so this is a very much a Kelly design. Uh, so I showed you Kelly's front yard. This is his side yard. Again, not a blade of grass to be found, uh, but this is his little coffee area off to the side. And so again, really dense planting. You can see this is all pretty much herbaceous perennials. So again, when I talk about work, he's got to go cut this back. He's got to mow it back every spring. Uh, a lot of this will go to seed, so he has to get out and, and prune it. But really incredibly lush, beautiful, beautiful planting. Again, lots of um, uh, native plants, echinacea, coneflower, uh, black-eyed Susan, mountain mint. So again, really dense planting. Then he flipped to the other side. Uh, the exact opposite of the Kelly. This is Tommy. Tommy is based on uh, Thomas Church, who was a landscape architect in California that really created that classic California art landscape architecture style. It's about clean lines, very tidy shapes. This is a little more fashion over function, where Kelly was maybe the exact opposite. Um, and as you go through the book, uh, you'll start to see little recipe cards, like you can see over here. So instead of just saying like, okay, here's Tommy, are you Tommy? We give you lots of recipe cards. I also do case studies. My house is one of them because uh, we bought the house a couple years ago and in December and realized that when the uh, spring came, everything except the, the large trees had been removed by the person that flipped the house. So we had a big wide open space and like our back fence, uh, fence line is 205 feet. So we have a lot of space to fill. Uh, so it can be, again, really intimidating, right? So we put a case study in like that to help uh, work through it. As well as in each section, I take that really scary list from the beginning of all the different uh, design elements that you need to think about to make a garden that's not just beautiful for today, but for the long term, and talk about what each of these design personalities would do. This is a very classic uh, Tommy design. This is. California, uh, naturally for him. But one of the things that I love to talk about with this, other than like clearly the architecture, very linear, all of that, the plants follow suit. But one of the things that I think is so fun about this one is when you're looking at that book and you're thinking about like how, where you fit in, like what style you might be, not just to skip ahead with the one that you think that you are, because this plant right here in the corner, it's called Sporobolus our prairie drop seed, which is an ornamental grass that a lot of us in the Midwest have in our yard. And usually it's in a Kelly planting, where it's really dense and you use that texture of the, of the, the late summer uh, and fall foliage uh, to help add a little bit of texture. But here, it's very linear, and they're using the sharp lines of that blade of grass uh, to accent that Tommy style. So that's what I think is so cool about this, is that you can find these plants that might work in one aesthetic, but also can work in so many others. So that's what, such a fun thing about plants that you can do and you can play with. Uh, this is uh, another, another version of Tommy. So like if you're like, this is not my style, that's okay. There's still other ways to do it with that more minimalistic approach. Uh, I mentioned Gordy, uh, my mom's uncle, the other day, or the other day, uh, earlier in the talk at uh, his place in uh, Newport, this is all a mass planting of a rose called All the Rage. Um, this is from that Easy Elegance collection. This is a planting that he's got just in front of his house. So that beautiful monochromatic planting, but also that single species or single variety is that really clean aesthetic, uh, but still really lush and beautiful. And then, of course, having that stone in there makes it feel very Minnesota, very North Shore, right? Should we talk about plants? This is always the favorite part. I should just skip the rest of it and just jump ahead of this. It's always the fun part. So I mentioned uh, that hydrangea that we started working on in 2014 that is just coming up this year. It's called Pop Star Hydrangea. Uh, I was get asked how we come up with the names for them. And it's honestly kind of a hard thing to do because there's so many plants out there. You can't copy a name because again, you can't trademark it. You have the battle of like, do you do something that describes what the plant looks like? Do you do something that's a little bit more fun? Uh, this one, Pop Star, we came up with because the blooms, uh, unlike a traditional mop head hydrangea, are flat. It's called a lace cap. And so it's got uh, the beautiful petals around the outside, and then the inside of it is the fertile flower. It's better for pollinators, easier for them to access. 
Um, so it kind of pops and looks like a, uh, a firework a little bit in the landscape. This is uh, the, the blue purple color. Naturally, we will not get here in Minnesota. We will naturally have pink. This type of hydrangea depends on the pH and presence of aluminum in the soil. We have, um, we have alkaline soils here in Minnesota, so this is the color that we will get, but it's the same plant. Uh, but if you have it like that looks like this and you want this, you just add aluminum sulfate to the soil. It's not going to happen immediately. It takes a little bit of time, but it will uh, turn to this sort of electric blue color. So this one is really special um, for those of you that have had in the summer uh, hydrangeas in your landscape before, uh, that some of like the original plants from 20 years ago, a little more site specific to get them to really bloom. Uh, I, I compare it to a car. You might drive the same kind of car you did 20 years ago, but you probably drive a newer model. Better safety features, they've upgraded the engine, you know, that sort of thing. Same thing with these hydrangeas. We work on getting them better and better and better. So these have better bug hardiness, so they don't die back as much in the winter. They also have incredible, incredible rebloom power. This is uh, the plant that really, for our industry, has set the new standard for rebloom. Uh, in that nine year gap of when we discovered this initial seedling to in production. We do a lot of trialing, a lot of testing. And one of the tests that we do is a root loop. So we cut it back after it is in full flower like this in the pot. We cut it back to a couple inches above the pot just to see how long does it take to put up new flower buds. Four weeks for this one. Uh, it is at least twice as fast as anything else that we have in trial. So what that means for us here is that even if it dies back or the buds get killed, it still is going to produce that many more flowers because it just genetically has that capability. And also, it only can get in Minnesota 18, 24 inches tall. So it's really cute and compact, but it also doesn't have those big long stems that has to send energy up uh, to produce those flower buds. So it stays more compact, really strong stems. So you have this beautiful lace cap flower that just covers it all season long, all the way through fall. So this is what we are really, really excited about this year. It takes us a lot to introduce something into that in the summer collection. There's only six hydrangeas that's, that are in there in the 20 years, we're celebrating the 20 years of brand next year. There's only six plants in there, so really particular. Uh, another one we're starting to see a lot of this in the landscape starting to light up. This is called Spring Fling Forsythia. Uh, there's a lot of Forsythia that are on the market, and so again, why would we introduce something new? It has to be better. Uh, so this, this one is still going to get a decent size. It's not going to get massive, but it's going to get four or five feet tall. This is uh, just down in our garden in Cottage Grove again. This one, uh, Spring Flame, blooms longer and more than other varieties that we've seen. So again, if you need that early pop of color, especially after a year like this where winter never quits, uh, this is a great new one that will be available this spring. This one uh, I have up by the table up there. I shouldn't say it in this room, but this is called Spicy Devil Nine Bark. Uh, there's, there are a number of uh, Nine Barks. Diablo is one that's been around forever. It's the big, massive, purple leaf one. Uh, there's one called Little Devil that we introduced a number of years ago. Uh, this is from the same breeder. Uh, he works at University of River Falls, Wisconsin, uh, Dr. David Slezak. And we asked him for uh, not one as purple as Diablo or Little Devil, and one not quite as uh, vibrant, there's one called Amber Jubilee that has picked up by the name, very amber. Uh, so it's something a little bit in between, and that's where we came up. This is the new growth. This one only gets about three, four feet tall, uh, three, four feet wide, planted in full sun, uh, really drought tolerant once it's established. Uh, these plants tend to get a lot of powdery mildew, which especially on a dark leaf plant like this, you don't want it covered in powdery mildew. Uh, so th this one was selected because it's incredibly resistant to it. Uh, this is what it looks like once it's mature, so it's a great backdrop plant, but still like not a huge hedge. Uh, it also so it has this in spring, then it has white flowers that bloom in spring, and then this for the summer. So I would say like, you need to find a plant that does more than one thing for you. It's got to have multiple seasons of, seasons of interest, especially if we, like a lot of the conversations I was having with you before, we don't have like massive yards to put a bunch of shrubs like this in, so if you're going to put something in, it's really got to be special. So something that has multiple seasons of interest is really important. Uh, a sibling of spicy is Mucky Devil. 
This is a new one. Uh, there's one called Darks Gold that has been on the market for a long time as well. Uh, gets a, lot, a little bit bigger, gets some powdery mildew issues. This one stays similar to Spicy, about three, four feet, tall and wide, incredibly disease resistant. Uh, this is, again, those spring flowers. This is what the flower looks like in the spring. Really, really vibrant against that beautiful gold foliage. It retains that color uh, throughout the summer. It doesn't burn. Um, that's the other thing with dark gold, is it will start to burn, especially if it's planted in full sun, which it should be. Uh, so to have that something that will be able to retain that is really important. Another hydrangea. I talk a lot about hydrangeas, but this one's really special. Uh, this was introduced a few years ago. This one's called Berry White. Uh, and when we introduced it, uh, my boss loved to speak in his very white voice, so we heard it all the time. Uh, but this is the type of hydrangea that blooms on new growth, so we would be grooming it about now, maybe about a month ago. Uh, it has the cone-shaped bloom. It starts blooming white in summer, so depending on the year, June, well, usually July here, blooms white. You can sort of see it in the background here. And then as the daytime stays warm and nighttime temperatures cool down, it turns this really incredible Merlot color. And this, this is a fairly big plant. It's gonna get about six feet tall. So if you're looking for a hedge and you don't want a herbivite, herbivite are fine. Again, something that does more than just being green is kind of nice sometimes. Uh, so having a hedge or something like this is really spectacular. Super strong stems. We do nothing in our, this is in our test garden, other than put drip irrigation down because we really want to put them through the ringer, right? So we don't do any really special pruning on this and they are standing super tall and the blooms get like this big on them. So it's really a showstopper, especially in the fall. I think this is my last hydrangea I'm gonna talk about, uh, but I can't promise anything. Uh, this one's called Little Hottie. Uh, this was new last year. Uh, this is a smaller hydrangea, so if you're looking for something like perfectly under your windowsill, this is only gonna get a few feet tall. This is a picture from our farm in Georgia. They obviously have a longer growing season, so sometimes things will get a little bit bigger. This is a fully established plant in the ground there, and it gets about to here on me. So it's, it stays, truly does stay small. Uh, there are some other compact hydrangeas on the market that uh, get seven feet tall, even though they say they get three. Um, so this one, again, we really wanted to test for a long time to make sure. But incredibly, really white flowers uh, in the summer. This is a picture from, again, our test garden where we do nothing special to it. And look, you can almost not see the green. There's so many dang flowers on this thing. So really, really incredible. And also, I want to show this production picture. This is uh, down at our farm in Hastings again, just to show how uh, similar every single one is. Look at how perfect the, the shape, all the blooms. This is all planted in full sun. This is what they look like, even in production, where we don't really care what the top looks like. All we're trying to do is put roots on. This is still what they look like. So again, if you're looking for a, a more compact plant, uh, this is one for you. And the last one. This one, it, I'm being a little selfish, but I always have to put this in a talk because it is, in my opinion, one of the most underutilized spring blooming shrubs for us here in Zone 4. This is called Lotus Moon Pearl Bush. And this is what it looks like in May. This is one plant, um, so it gets some good size on it, four or five feet tall, but it can handle pruning really well, so if you just want to keep it small, which we do in our display garden, it back in time. But this incredible shot of white flowers is so beautiful in the landscape. Um, this is what it looks like in front of our office in Newport. Uh, I mentioned Amber Jubilee Nine Dark earlier. This is Amber Jubilee over here, so this is what that early season color looks like. Uh, fun fact, it was uh, came from a Canadian breeder, Canada, UK, the Queen's Jubilee anniversary. This is why it was named Amber Jubilee. The Queen came to Canada and planted this. So we got a picture of the Queen with the Amber Jubilee. So this is Amber Jubilee Nine Park. This is a standing ovation service berry. If you're looking for an, a compact upright shrub, if you're especially trying to make a hedge and maybe block out your neighbors or something, this is a great one. Blooms in spring, berries for the birds in summer, and great fall color. Uh, again, if you're looking for early, early color in the garden, this is called Matcha Ball Ash Leaf Spirea. Uh, in front here, you can see a little bit of the amber tones on the new growth. It's called Ashley Spirea. It's not a Spirea. It's actually the Latin name for it is Sorberia. I don't know why I 
It's called actually spirea, but it is. Uh, but it's one of the first shrubs that we see starting to put out leaves. It's almost fully leafed out like this in front of our office right now. But then you can see, especially with all that color, this is like a very Martha planting design, right? Having all that color balanced by that white of the bloom. And this is what they look like up close. So you can see on this one why it's called pearl bush. As they start to develop the flowers, it looks like a little strand of pearls, and then opens up to that sort of fan of white. So I've got some of the, uh, the new plants out by the table out front uh, that you can take a look at on your way out. You can find them in the garden centers probably in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm happy to answer questions in here, out there. Uh, feel free if you've got questions to email me or send me a message on uh, Instagram. I always love to see projects that people are working on. Uh, but thank you to Hill Murray. Uh, thank you to everyone for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. It's a very special moment to be able to come back and be with all of you. So thank you very much.